Seriously. Hey guys, how are you doing? What time is it? It's 9 o'clock on a Tuesday night. And what am I doing here? This guy's making a mess. <laughs> so I've got um, spelt flour here. So I'm actually making bread. I'm actually making a mess. So, <laughs> so I got a bunch of spelt flour. So I'm gonna, I made this uh, about a month ago, three or four weeks ago. And, uh, and, the, and the bread was amazing. It's just 100% uh, spelt flour. So no white flour, no whole wheat flour. And just spelt. Hey, so how are you? And, uh, and I'm prone to make a really big mess out of it. So, um, yeah, so spelt flour, it's a good thing. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's actually interesting when you, you, know, you spend more time actually preparing things and cooking things, it's actually, it's a little bit more interesting. So quick yeast, can't say that, um, Actually, the, my first attempt at making bread was freaking amazing. It actually turned out so good. So I think it was just luck of the draw for me. I think I was just kind of lucky. But we'll see if I can actually pull it off again. Yeah, I know. Isn't it great? Yeah. So it's, uh, but there's something about, uh, something about making your own food. I just, uh, today, I just finished packaging up um, five bags of, um, uh, five freezer bags full of uh, five cup servings of sprouted uh, legumes. So uh, peas, chickpeas, and, uh, and turtle beans. And so I sprouted them over a 48 hour period. And, uh, and then I, um, um, then I separated them in five cup servings and froze them. So I've got a bunch of that stuff already put away, uh, which is kind of exciting. Uh, so, and tonight actually I made, um, I cut up an onion, five chunks of garlic, and um, yeah, uh, what, yellow onion, five cups of garlic, or five uh, five pieces of garlic, and um, some cumin and, uh, and cayenne. And that was it. And then uh, so I cooked up five cups of uh, beans, really slow cooked, like slow cooked over the course of about an hour under low. And then I cooked up two cups of rice to do two cups of rice in it because rice and beans are complementary. And uh, yeah, so I make, um, so I make, uh, um, so I make kind of a bean paste and then I use it almost like in lasagna type things, uh, lasagna type meals. I use it um, in uh, bean burritos. I'll use it uh, on, on toast with an avocado. So it's, it's been pretty interesting actually. It just, uh, you know, and I don't mind eating the same thing over and over again, you know, which is, uh, you know, which a lot of people get a little bored and, and take the time. I mean, you know, I could be watching television, right? I could be watching, uh, be you know, and uh, I'd be watching Netflix, and I'm not, right? I just, um, I'm, you know, it, I'm preparing food, and it's something about eating the food that you make, especially good food, right? Stuff that you know it's actually going to nourish you, um, because it's, uh, you know, part of the, part of the, the. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, so they're actually like refried beans, absolutely. And, uh, but it's just, but I really, I, the challenge is to really slow cook them, uh, to slow cook them so that you don't, uh, you don't actually kill the enzymes in them. You don't actually kill the nutrition. And so, you know, put them on low heat and because I soaked them for two days, so for 48 hours, um, because I, because I soak them for 48 hours, um, it uh, makes them quite soft to start with. And sorry, I got a cat is being, uh, being a nuisance. Um, you soak them for 48 hours, they're really quite soft already because of the uh, because they've been soaked and so they don't take them very long to cook. So you put them in low heat and then you cook them over about an hour period of time on this kind of a simmer and uh, they, they turn out really well that way. So I'm just uh, actually I'm just grabbing some water here, but the um, you know this, this interesting process of actually preparing and preparing your own food. Is uh, it's actually kind of fascinating because it's just you, uh, you know, um, you start you start understanding flavors a little bit more. You start understanding how things work rather than just you know I you know I, I use a lot of meal replacements because it's convenient for my life. But 
it is a little old sometimes and so it's nice actually having things prepared so again in my freezer there's five there's five freezer bags full of um, of, uh, of um, sprouted uh, sprouted beans and so that I'll take one out just like we used to do uh, when I was growing up we'd throw you know, you'd, uh, parents would wake up in the morning and they'd throw a roast in the, in the uh, frozen roast or a hamburger or something. They'd throw that in the sink and they'd be thawing it over the day and of course you'd have that for dinner later that night. So I just do the same thing with beans. So it's, uh, but it, it's just the, you know, I, I think the challenge is that it just, uh, um, you know, we had to start, real, start looking at this process a bit more and really, you know, uh, really starting to... Um, invest the time and take the effort to actually design, build and design our meals. And uh, as much as I'm a huge fan of using meal replacements for supplements, they're just that, they're supplements. They supplement a good diet. They're not there, they're not there uh, necessarily for a lifetime of being lazy, which a lot of people can use it for, right? A lot of people have a tendency to get a little lazy and not want to cook. But there's, there's so much that we don't understand about... Uh, about food and the nutrition and food that we just we just don't quite have a, the grasp on it. Um, so meaning that it, there, there's certain nutrients, there's certain things, uh, there's certain fibers and stuff that we need that we, we require to food that we just don't get that we just don't get from a shake, right? So I still have uh, two to three meal replacements a day. So they're uh, you know, vegetarian meal replacements. I have two to three a day. Um, but I'm also very conscious about actually getting uh, all, a bigger variety of fiber in my diet as well, um, because it's important. And it's not just for you know you know for people talking about you know having healthy bowel movement, which you know I, not a real big topic of conversation. That's what I want to talk about. But it's uh, but 80 percent of my immunity is in my gut, and 80 percent of our immunity is in our gut, and and our gut actually is built off of a uh, yeah no cookbook, Sean. <laughs> 80% uh, of our immunity is in our gut, and our gut actually it thrives on fiber, right? So if there's no fiber in your diet, uh, and there's a very limited amount, you have a limited amount of fiber in your diet, then you have a limited amount of the microorganisms that keep you healthy. Um, and there's a correlation between uh, mental health, brain health, of course, and uh, everything else. Um, so, so if my, my guts are happy because I'm feeding them, then my brain is also going to be happy, you know, for the most part. Uh, my guts are happy, then I have a high degree of immunity. And so it's really trying to make sure that all these, these parts are really put together so that, that it's not just about eating healthy and eating good food. It's just, you know, I'm comprised of billions and billions of cells, 80 billion cells just in the body alone, not to mention the trillions of cells in my gut, not to mention the billions of cells in my brain. And, and, and what are they made from? What are they made from? They're made from the stuff that you shove down your face on an on ongoing basis. And, and are, we, are we surprised? Right? Are we surprised that the are we surprised that the level of, uh, of the level of illness that we see around us, and um, you know, from mental health illness to uh, to cancers to uh, like it just the list goes on and on and on. Are we are we the least bit surprised? You know, we can't be, right? And we and as much as we want to sue McDonald's and sue uh, Benson and Hedges and sue all these companies. I mean, truly, sorry, I got a cat. <laughs> the cat's tearing my weather stripping off my door because it wants to go play outside. <laughs> uh, you know, we can't sue these companies and saying, how could you, and shaking your fist at these corporations when you can't tell me that you don't know that Lunchables are shit food. You, do, you can't tell me that you, don't, you know that's, that's not garbage. You just can't tell me that that's possible, right? You can't tell me that you know, eating a McDonald's seven days a week, uh, that, that you don't know that's, that's garbage. I mean, how, how can you not know? So the trick of it is, of course, the challenge, the challenge is, and we'll let this stuff rise for a while, so this, gonna let this uh, sit for a little bit. So the challenge is that, in, is that it's, you know, the, 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 the conversation goes around, uh, you know, economics, right, social economics. So, you know, we can't afford to eat healthy. Um, but it's, you know, I went out and I bought, um, my chickpeas, my, my garbanzo, my chickpeas, my, um, whole peas and my, uh, turtle beans. Sounds so weird when I say that, <laughs> but uh, I bought all these and, um, and I spread and I soaked them and I got 25 cups, 25 cups of beans, right? Sprouted, 
you know, hyper healthy nutrition. And it made, uh, it'll make probably, it'll probably give me personally, and I'm, I'm a good eater. So it'll probably give me, you know, probably about two weeks worth of, worth of protein for pennies, for freaking pennies, right? But you got to take the time. You got to, you know, I had a sink full of freaking beans. I had to soak them and I had to wash them and, and kidneys, soak them, wash them over the course of a couple of days. So just, to, I mean, probably in, in total, total labor, it took me probably 30 minutes over two days. And then the final day was just get the freezer bags, put them in the freezer. Yeah, I got to think about cooking and I got to, you know, take a little bit of time to put the stuff together. But it's, um, <laughs> Uh, Jules, well, why do you, you know, it's, well, uh, maybe I'll do it again, right? Next time you have veggie soup, I'll make sure I have some bread, bread ready for you. Um, but it's, um, you know, it, it, I don't know. It's just, I think the, I, I think the challenge is that it's just, and I've, I've talked about this a lot, is about the knowing better and doing better. And, you know, how do we, how do we cross that, how do we cross that threshold? How do we, um, how do we inspire people to do more? It's just, you know, it. Uh, you know, information is uh, information is kind of um, information is kind of useless because information is not power. You know, information that we can apply is power, right? And it's uh, and, and I think that inherently the challenge that we have is that we have a, a world full of excuses and people not willing to not willing to take the time. It just, you know, it. You know, I think the, the amount of reading I've done in the past 25 years, the things that I pull apart um, in, in the past, um, you know, in the past 25 years, I mean, you know, I just, I, I guess, and I had a great conversation with uh, my mother stopped by and we had a glass of wine together and we had a great conversation, so it was uh, hugely appreciative, um, you know, um, but, but, and she, she made a really valid point um, tonight when we were talking about the the level of uh, the level of understanding that people have, and it's um, you know I uh, you know I sat on a, I sat on a uh, committee uh, many years ago for not for a very short period of time, and the committee was around providing food for the uh, 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 food for the people that were disadvantaged in our community, and and the foodstuffs they're giving of course are, are non perishables like you know like craft dinner and soups and you know canned canned goods. And these were for the people that are disadvantaged, and and I, I understand the idea behind it, but it's just it, it, if we continue to feed people that disadvantage disadvantaged food, and there's no way and there's no conversation around, and we understand how important uh, you know how important food is to our survival because it's not just food; it's the framework of our thought processes. It's the framework of our emotional state. It's the framework of our immune system. It's the framework of our reproductive system. It's the framework of everything. And yet, we, we get these these conversations around you know it's just that it just doesn't seem that important, or it's too expensive, or we couldn't possibly ask people to change their point of view. We couldn't possibly ask people to change their lifestyle. Um, you know, we couldn't possibly ask people to be more personally accountable to their own health. And we couldn't possibly ask people, to, you know, to take a step up. And, and I don't, and I, I get it, but I don't get it. Because it's just, you know, if we're not willing to change, if we're not willing to be accountable, if we're not willing to explore, we're not willing to, uh, to have a bigger conversation, then we have no room to complain about our lot in life. And, you know, and it's, and I can speak freely, freely about this because I, you know, I, I lived in all different circumstances. Um, you know, I, I've been homeless for uh, for a, a chunk of my life, and I, I, you know, I was lost in that world, and I know what that world is like. I know what that world looks like. Um, I was in the world of drugs and alcohol and and fast food, and I know what that world looks like. Like I've lived all sorts of different lives, which is why I feel very comfortable and you know having an opinion about certain things or having. Um, yeah, taking taking a stance and and uh, a fairly strong stance in conversation because it's because I've been through all those pieces and and I work my way out of it with no any greater degree of of uh, intelligence other than the fact that it's just I continue to ask better questions. Uh, I found some Tony Robbins CDs um, in my in my truck and it just and I start re-listening to them again and and actually one of his great things he said it's he said one of the reasons why we don't have the quality of life that we 
that we desire or we that think we deserve, right? I think that's the important thing. The reason why we don't have the quality of life we think we deserve is that we ask, we ask bad questions. We, we just don't ask the right questions. And so the questions that we ask of life is that, you know, it, we should be asking the questions, how do I move forward from here? Who do I need to talk to who is already there? And, you know, if you, you know, the only, if you heard the old expression, if you ask a stupid question, get a stupid answer. And, and I think the world has, you know, and again, it's a very broad statement, has, is perpetually asking stupid questions because they're asking, why me, right? You know, why is this happening to me? Um, and then, of course, when you're asking a question like that, you know, like, why am I sick or why is this happening? Or like, you know, sometimes I, I found like there is no answers for some of the questions that we're asking. It just, it is what it is. So now what, right? Um, I think that was, a, I, I, I mentioned uh, this quote from, uh, uh, Carolyn Miss, who had this uh, uh, watch this uh, this uh, talk she gave, and Carolyn Miss, who's a spiritual uh, author and really quite amazing, but she's like like Mother Teresa as a gangster, right? Can you imagine Mother Teresa as a gangster? You know, here's God, I'm going to punch in the throat with him, <laughs> and uh, she, you know, she says something very poignant, which I absolutely loved. I, actually, this was when I was in Nicaragua, I saw this video. She said, "Okay, imagine." Imagine that uh, you could uh, imagine that you you called out to God and uh, you said, and, and God decided he, God was sent uh, three of His best angels and they're going to answer your questions. And you looked up and said, God, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why why is the state of affairs the way it is? And the angel said, Okay, well here's the message, because it is. Now what? <laughs> All right, just because it is. Now what are you going to do? This is what it is. What are you going to do? And there was no room for blame. There was no room for uh, for uh, you know, making conversation about uh, who, you know who we should go attack or who we should uh, you know cast dispersions on. It's no. It is what it is. What are you going to do with it? And, and I think that's a great premise for uh, a big step forward in the conversation we're having around with lots of things. But of course, with health for sure. It is what it is. What are you going to do about it? You know, there's. There's a gentleman that I know, uh, he, he goes to the gym, um, I, I've known this guy for quite a few years, uh, and he, he, you know, he's had a lot of tragedy in his life, his daughter died of brain cancer, um, he has MS, he was a client of mine years ago, and, and it was interesting, it just, you know, I said to him, is that, it, you know, he, he said, yeah, I'm starting to lose my balance more, it's become more challenging, and I said, well, tell you what, you know, if you just, let me, you know, the, you know, this is my profession, right? I've studied this thing in and out. So this is my profession. I don't have all the answers, but I think I have some pretty good, I offer some pretty good advice on some fundamental things that you can do. And I, you know, I talked about certain exercises. So for this gentleman, I said, you need, you need to not sit down actually. You need to get off your ass and stand up. There's some cable work you need to do. You need to really force your body to start paying attention. And then I mentioned, I said, there's a lot of really beautiful information around fasting and what fasting uh, and what fasting can do for you as far as helping your body recover, especially when you're looking at things with MS. There's some beautiful stuff out there. And, you know, and he wouldn't hear it. He just, you know, he's, you know, and, and I like this guy. He's, he's a neat needle character, but he just, he couldn't hear it. And I'm going, and I'm, and I'm wondering, like, how much of the world is like that now? They just don't want to hear it, right? They've had their lot in life for uh, for a certain amount of time. They've had this experience. They've lived in this experience. They've identified 100% with their experience, and uh, and despite you know God could have come down and the uh, 12 doves and son of a cross could fly over his house, and he he just wouldn't take uh, he's he wouldn't take the possibility that things could be different. He's so caught up in this conversation, and you know and I I can kind of. Uh, I can never relate to him because I've had my own periods of time, my own struggles, you know, with trying and getting caught up in a thing that you just couldn't escape. But, um, but it, it's it's interesting. I, I just I just see so much of our our world is caught up in the in the story and this, this really extraordinary um, extraordinary conversation that we continue to continue to uh, relate back and forth to each other. Uh, about why things are the, are the way they are. You know, getting old means this. Having MS means this. Having cancer means this, right? Uh, you know, struggling with weight means this. And there's got to be, the, the, you know, there really needs to be a purpose much greater than the illnesses that we that we um, that we harbor. Uh, a, a, 
I remember a conversation that somebody had with a monk. Uh, the monk was dying of cancer, and he had a tear running down his eyes. And, uh, and, and one, of the, one of the pupils asked, asked him, said, you know, Master, you know, are you, you know, are you sad? He says, no, well, like, you know, I'm, you know, are you in pain? He says, well, actually, my body's in pain, and I'm sad for my body. He, he didn't identify with his physical being. He actually knew he was, he was something quite different. This, he had this corporeal structure called the human body that he used as a vehicle to, to, to get him around on a spiritual journey while I was here on Earth. But it, he didn't identify with it. <clears throat> but neither did he. But neither was it a case for abuse of your own body. But I think that mindfulness that we can have, and the ability to separate ourselves from who we are physically, and to be objective about the way we see ourselves, I think much more powerful conversations, uh, and much more powerful decisions can be made when we learn to not identify with who we are uh, as a physical structure. I don't identify with with who I am physically. I I observe who I am. Uh, physically and then I make decisions based on what's best for this machine because I have work to do. I have children to look after, I have a, I have a career that's continued to grow and expand. Uh, there's things that I want to do before I leave this earth and require this thing has to be functioning. What I, do, what I don't want is to be, a, to be, be negligent on my self-care so I become a burden uh, on society where uh, because of my lack of interest and in, in how to look after my physical self now I'm costing, you know, I'm costing that healthcare system tens of thousands of dollars because I wasn't paying attention and I had a bunch of excuses of why this is the way it is. I'm not going to do that, and uh, I'll be damned if I do that. Um, so I, because I think all of us, we know that you know, the, it's we know that there's a, we know that there's something out there that we need to be doing. We know that there's things that we want to do before this before life ends. Um, Wayne Dyer had this uh, had this great conversation around around our death, and he said, you know, most people live in this world, and and they live in this ignorance or this uh, this avoidance of the fact that that we're all going to die, that you're that we're going to die, right? I mean, he said nobody gets off this planet alive, nobody gets out alive. So make peace with the fact that you that you will that you have an ultimate demise, and then decide how you're going to live while you're here. So you know all this food prep, all this this exercise, this healthy living, this this challenging of one's own personal psychology and philosophy, and this paying attention, being a being a part of a community and uh, an organic community, being uh, recognizing our role in the, uh, the universal ecosystem, being conscious to our impact on the world around us, to our community, to the people that care for us, uh, being mindful of all those pieces. You know, it's it's not a lot to ask. It's called being a human, and and being self-aware, and we're just caught up in this world that we're just you know there, there's there's a society for every problem that we have going on, but there's a, <laughs> but there's no society for get over it and get on with it, right? <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a big community, a big society for that, because it's as much as we like to lick our wounds, the world simply goes on. Right. If you if you work for you work for a corporation, right, and uh, if you can't make it to work, and you've been there 25 years, and you get sick, and you miss a bunch of time, you get replaced. Right. That's just the way it is. And so I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think one of the something that we used to think that used to be the thought process many many years ago, and certainly is not the conversation we hear anymore, is is we we do our part of our goal in life is for future generations. And this is going back in probably in the 40s, I think 40s and 50s is when that conversation started to, started to die out, when people became more self-absorbed, but what can I get for me now? What can I do for my own personal, personal improvement, right? Uh, what can I get for me uh, in, the current, in the current day and age? And, and not really thinking about what I'm leaving for the, uh, for the uh, future generations. And that is obviously not the conversation because look at the state of the world. But, but I, I think if we, can, we, if we can impart, if we can understand that that's our role as a, as a organism, as a human organism, is that we are, we are deciding the fate of our, of our species by our daily, by our actions. So whether it's in, in thought, word, and deed, everything I do, it leaves a, a, um, leaves a very tangible impact on this, on this universal ecosystem that I find myself living in. And I'm very conscious of it. 
right? So uh, you know the you know the emissions I put into the air, uh, the detergent I use in my vehicle, uh, I use them use a wash of my clothes, um, the food I prepare. Um, you know, I'm just trying to be more conscientious of what is my impact on the world. What is because it, it is a very definite one, uh, conscious or not. Uh, the the impact the impact you have is very tangible, uh, whether you realize it or not. And so at the end of the day, everything that we do, I think if we look at future generations, if we make it less about what's in it for me, but, but what's in it for, what's in it for, what's in it for the future of, uh, of the lives that are yet to come? What's in it for my kids? What's in it for my, my great grandchildren and their great grandchildren? And it's, uh, and I think, it, you know, if we, if we really take the time and to embrace the fact that, you know, your days are numbered, and uh, because they are, <laughs> um, which is not a bad thing because it just, it is what it is. And you look at the ability of